All right, so um, my name is uh, Mike Trisna. I'm a data scientist with the Smithsonian um, in a group called the Smithsonian OCIO, um, which is our IT office uh, data science lab. Um, and I'm gonna be talking today about um, the Smithsonian open access uh, project that uh, started last year um, and making the data that was released with that more accessible uh, using Python and Dask. Um, and then uh, show a few uh, examples of, of that in practice. Okay, so to start off, um, the Smithsonian. Um, a lot of people don't realize um, that, yes, there are uh, 19 museums, um, mostly in, in Washington, D.C., that are part of the Smithsonian um, Institution. We do have uh, one in, actually two in New York, um, but they're, they're not necessarily just in Washington, D.C. We also have uh, 21 libraries and archives, nine research centers, and a zoo. So there are lots of different um, units at the Smithsonian uh, working on, I don't know, the, the craziest uh, uh, range of, of different topics. So the Smithsonian's mission, um, I'm not sure if, if people know the, the origin story, uh, if you will, of the Smithsonian, but um, it was founded in 1846 um, from an Englishman named John James Smithson. Um, he had never uh, uh, visited the, the U.S., but decided to leave his inheritance to the United States government um, with this idea that uh, the United States government uh, start uh, an organization uh, known as the Smithsonian Institution. So he thought very highly of himself, uh, just grabbing that name. Um, but the I think this is so cool. The, the mission would be to... Uh, for the increase and diffusion of knowledge, which is like such a, a bold statement. I love it. Um, so this is a, a pretty cool uh, comic that I, I came across uh, a few years ago online, and I've, I've printed it out, um, stuck it on my, my desk when I used to work at a, a desk at an office. Um, but it, it shows the progression from data, um, where you, you're just kind of collecting raw data out, um, and, out in the field or something like that. Um, it becomes information. As you connect to different pieces, it becomes knowledge and then insight. And then finally, wisdom. Um, I've also seen this uh, uh, comic kind of ex extended recently um, to, to show uh, connections that aren't there. Um, and it's labeled uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, but that's, that's another story. Um, so the Smithsonian has been increasing and diffusing knowledge, which is this, this central uh, panel here. But what about all of that data, which is the first panel here? So um, all of that, that data and info, those are the first two panels um, that, that feed into knowledge, insight, and wisdom. They're all being uh, cataloged and stored in, in drawers across the Smithsonian. This is a, a cool shot from the um, entomology department um, at the Natural History Museum to show you that there are just like floors and floors of these racks of, of drawers that are closed most of the time. So you don't get to see this on, the, on a daily basis, but it's it's kind of cool to, to see the contents of, of all these drawers. And it, it really kind of starts to hurt your brain a little bit when you try and comprehend all of the different, uh, the amount of data that is, is stored at the Smithsonian, both in the drawers and uh, we're, digitizing more and more of that. Okay, so um, that was the, the previous state was a lot of things in drawers. Um, then the Smithsonian made the decision um, uh, in throughout 2019, we were kind of ramping up to this and then uh, had a launch event in February of 2020 um, to uh, create the open access um, uh, policy to, to share our data on a on a um, CC0 license. Um, and this is a, a photo from the, op uh, the open access launch event. I, I took it there. Um, you may note that late February, 2020, that's um, known as the, the before times now. It was kind of weird. We were all packed into the American History Museum, but it, um, it, was, a, it was a pretty neat event. Um, so yeah, what, what is in the open access release? So, 
across the Smithsonian, this is just an estimate because we can't really count it all. Um, there are 155 million objects, um, 2.1 million library volumes, and then a ton of feet of archival collections. So it's just boxes of people's notes, essentially. Um, but within the open access release itself, there are 2.8 million 2D, um, mostly 2D images. And then we also have a lot of uh, 3D scans in there as well. Um, and then uh, kind of most useful to a, a person like me, um, we have, we've made all of the metadata uh, records for all of the digitized um, objects we have in our collections um, available. And there are over 17 million of those at, at last count. Okay, so what does open access mean? I've kind of been throwing this around uh, this term around. So before February 2020, when we had our open access launch, um, all the Smithsonian museums um, and research units um, they made their their data available um, and searching, but it was kind of on uh, uh, their own uh, policies. They they set up their own search engines or um, data dumps, um, but it, it varied by unit. There was no consistency um, in in terms of um, uh, uh, I guess uh, formatting, uh, keeping things consistent or anything like that. There were also Pretty much every unit had their own uh, use usage agreements. Um, so I I worked at the Natural History Museum uh, then, and I know the the term of use said that you can use any of the data for an educational purpose. Um, however, what this um, the open access did um, was it made all of the the media that fell under the open access policy um, completely open access. So um, uh, on the CC0, um, uh, that stands for a copyright, uh, something copyright uh, zero policy, which means you can take any of the, the um, images that are, are distributed through this and do whatever you want with them. Um, you, can, you can take scans of, of paintings, you can reproduce them, sell them, make money of, off of them. Um, and uh, the idea here is to, to kind of put all of these things out there, they're um, funded by the US taxpayers anyway, so they, they kind of belong in the, um, in the uh, open realm there um, and see what people do with them. Okay, so um, how can all of this data be accessed? Um, we, I said that we release this data, but what does that mean in, in actuality? So I'm gonna cover uh, three different ways um, that you can access uh, all of the Smithsonian open access data. Um, and all three of them share their, uh, the metadata records um, in the exact same consistent uh, JSON structure. Um, and I note here that it's deeply nested and I'll show you an example of, of that later. So the first way of um, accessing the, or accessing the open access data, sorry, there's a lot of access here, um, is through a, a web API. Um, so uh, I have a link there. I'll, I'll share the, the link to these uh, slides afterwards. Um, so you can click on all of these links. Um, what this link gives you is the um, self-contained um, uh, documentation and kind of like a playground. You can um, test out the, the different endpoints in there. Um, you do need to sign up for an API key to, to use it. Um, however, it's it's free. I, I believe they only access or ask for your uh, email address, um, and it's it's a quick turnaround. It's, it's automated, um, and I, I recommend it for for getting a feel for how the the data is organized and what the record structure looks like because it's a little peculiar. Okay, so the API um, is kind of the um, most marketed um, form of, of getting to the data. Um, however, if you're interested in doing some big things with the, um, the whole data set, you're going to run into some uh, limitations pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> so the limitations I, I list here are that the, the records are pretty extensively indexed for searching. So if you want to search on a certain um, term, if you want to search for like a, a person, um, all of the, the names are indexed. Um, 
However, you're, you're quickly going to find examples of, of things that you know are in records, but you can't search directly. Um, uh, and another is the, the limit of, um, uh, you're only limited to a thousand records per API call. If you're looking to do some sort of analysis across um, millions of records, across uh, multiple units, that's just not going to be feasible. Um, so um, uh, I want to show you a, a, uh, an example of, of where I use the, the web API and then the, the, our other sources. Um, and I want to set that up here. So um, in, in 2017, our, the data science group that I'm a part of now, they did this actually before I joined the group. So they um, uh, did a little pilot project <clears throat> where they went into the holdings of the, uh, the botany department at the Natural History Museum. Um, and the botanists traditionally store all of their uh, plant specimens on a, a flat sheet. Um, and they have those in, um, in drawers um, at, at the Natural History Museum. And, and they're great for digitizing because they're these flat pieces of, of, of paper. And they actually set up a, a conveyor belt. Um, I, I completely forgot to include that in here, but they set up a conveyor belt that um, takes pictures um, one by one as these things come through. Um, so we have a, a ton of digitized herbarium sheets. So one um, example project we, we tried out was to try and detect um, uh, herbarium sheets that had been stained with mercury. Um, this was a, um, uh, a practice, uh, a, I think in the 1800s, early 1900s, um, as um, plant specimens came in from the field, a lot of times they had bugs or mold or thing like, things like that. They wanted to kill all of those bugs and mold, but kind of preserve what the plant specimen looked like. So they would dip it in mercury, which um, at the time, nobody really realized that, oh, mercury actually is pretty dangerous. Um, uh, we, should, we should stop doing this. Um, they did eventually, but we now have these sheets that are soaked in mercury. Um, and people who, who work with the um, sheets uh, on a daily basis are able to, to spot them. Um, but this is, was a, a, a great uh, chance to try out machine learning to see if we could, I mean, uh, take a, a set of expert identified um, mercury stained sheets, um, as well as uh, sheets that we knew were not stained by mercury and build a machine learning model to differentiate between the two of them across the entire collection. Um, and there's a link to that paper in there. Um, so that that paper was uh, uh, completed and, and published in 2017. Um, if you work in machine learning or or are familiar with the um, the field, 2017 is kind of ancient history from from now. Um, a lot has changed since then, um, and I was I was looking to to duplicate the same um, uh, experiment. Um, and, and use some of the, the more modern techniques uh, to build a model. So I wanted to get all of those, those training images and, and do it again. Um, so all of the images were shared on, on Figshare as part of this um, uh, paper, but I wanted to get the, the original um, images from, from the database because um, the ones that were shared to Figshare were resized. And I also wanted to get the, all of the the metadata around it, like when when were these um, specimens collected by who, to see if we could um, use that to to build a, a more accurate model. Okay, so here is this example of the um, the record format um, that we we published these records to um, out in. So this, believe it or not, is a single. Um, uh, a botany record um, and all of these different pieces of information are included in here and you can see they're kind of like variously nested if you if you look through here um, all i had from the figshare um, uh, repository was the barcode and like i said um, barcode was not one of those index terms so i couldn't search on barcodes so even though i had a list of several thousand barcodes i couldn't use the api to grab all of the images of uh, the herbarium sheets that I needed. Um, so I had to um, download the entire data set and, and work through that. So this shows you kind of like how nested that, that might be. Um, I, this picture is kind of funny to me. It's, it reminds me of like those Mars rover 
um, pictures where they stitch together multiple images into a mosaic. Um, and I kind of had to do the same thing to, to capture the entire uh, JSON record. OK, so I mentioned the full data set. Um, and there are two different sources for that. So this is um, option two and three for accessing um, the Smithsonian open access data. Um, the first is on uh, AWS S3, which uh, stores uh, static data. Um, and it, that source has all of the metadata records as well as all of the open access images can be accessed from there. Um, so it's pretty quick to download. Um, and then GitHub has all of only the, the metadata. However, it's, it's versioned. And I'll show you a, a few other um, advantages to using GitHub. Um, and the way that the files are packaged are um, as uh, line delimited JSON, so slightly diff different than the, the normal JSON you may be used to. Um, they're compressed using bzip2 um, to, to save space um, and make it easier to download. Um, and the directories are all organized by which unit they came from. And then the files are split up according to how they are hashed. Um, and I'll show you an example of, of what that means. So you probably can't squint and see this, but this I'll describe this is a screenshot of the um, holdings from the American History Museum. And it's split into all of these different files. Um, you see the, you may see that the first file here is 00.txt.bz2. Um, following the, the hashing structure, there are almost always 256 of these of varying sizes across all of the units. Um, so that's a little intimidating if you open up, if you say like, I downloaded all of the American history records and you get this. So, um, Bummer, if you need to go through every single file one at a time to, to try and, and do um, something with that, it's gonna take a lot, a lot of time. Um, there are almost 10,000 files across all the units to process. Um, but believe it or not, there's actually a benefit to having so many files. Um, I'm not sure if it was thought about before, but I, my eyes lit up when I saw that there were so many different files because we can use that to, to multitask. I'm going to um, just jump in here and say there's five minutes left. Yep, got it. So this is where Dask comes in. Um, Dask is a, a Python library that's built exactly for um, multitasking processes. So um, here's a little GIF from the, the Dask website that shows you how that you can set up um, a, a miniature cluster on your own uh, computer. Most of what I'm, I'm going to show you here was done on my laptop. Um, or you can actually scale using the exact same code to uh, real compute clusters, either in the cloud or on um, uh, high performance compute clusters. Um, this is uh, a screen grab that I, I took uh, yesterday, actually, when I was trying to uh, count the number of images for that, or the number of records for that 17 million count here. Um, and this shows um, how Dask is, is able to um, split um, tasks ac across different processors. Um, and uh, it, it, it shows you in this really cool dashboard, which, which I love just watching. I could watch this kind of all day. Um, so um, Dask may be known a little bit more for its uh, parallel processing of data frames, so like tabular data. Um, but it's, it's really great also at um, uh, parsing uh, text data, like uh, the JSON data that we have. So these are the lines right here uh, that it takes to process every single one of the records, either from S3 or from GitHub. Um, this is the exact line of code that you would need to run to, to process all of those at the same time. Um, and the way that it does it, Dask is uh, delayed uh, um, in its computing. So it, it kind of like, uh, identifies all of the different file locations um, and then um, uh, sets it up so that you can compute against those um, when you're ready. Um, and they also have a, a built-in S3 connector. So they, they know that people store a lot of data on S3 and um, they have a connector ready to, to um, uh, connect in. Um, here's an example of uh, going back to that uh, Mercury sheet um, example. Um, I downloaded the entire um, uh, natural history botany collection, which is gi gigantic um, in terms of the number of records. Um, but I, I wrote a little function to pull out the IDs and 
these are the the lines that you it takes to to grab a piece a useful information from that that crazy nested uh, JSON record um, and what it looks like when you can pull it out and you can actually do some processing on it. Okay, so um, I wanted to to point out a, another um, cool example. Um, I've been working with a. Uh, uh, an intern from uh, George Mason University, uh, Patrick McManus, who may or may not be in the audience, um, uh, but he and I worked together. He's, he focuses on American history. Um, we looked at the holdings of the American History Museum to, to look at the different dates in there um, and how different topics, different places show up across different dates. Um, and this is a screenshot of a Streamlit app we, we built together. Um, and then another example, um, there's a link here, um, is a, a tutorial we built as, as part of our uh, launch with AWS um, that shows how to pull down all of the, the painting images um, from the American Art Museum um, and then run them through a machine learning uh, model to uh, cluster them by the content. And you can't really tell um, at, at closer glance, but you can zoom in on a, on a larger um, a cluster image we have on, on the GitHub that's linked here and, and see why um, the painting showed where they did in, in this big cluster. Okay, and that's it, so. All right, well, the... we have time for one question. So let's go ahead and take uh, Megan O'Donnell from Iowa State University asks, dare I ask what metadata schema or schemas the metadata is in? I I don't actually know. Um, I mean, there's no like quick answer to that. There is a, <laughs> a documented JSON schema for I think all of the different units, um, and I believe it's it's on GitHub. Um, I can I can share that um, in the in the Slack question and answer afterwards. Um, but I don't know if there's like a name to the schema that we came up with. I think it may or may not have been um, created or organically to, to fit our needs. 